Hi, thanks for checking out the Catalyst Church sermons. We hope you enjoy this message and pray that God speaks to you through the words that are preached. Have a great day. them today. Mobile phone, a device of some description. If you have one, I want you to get it out right now if it's nearby and put it in your hands. If it's too hard to get to, don't worry about it. Just a note, my phone's on airplane mode for those of you who want to text me right now. It's not getting through. Now, this device, uh, do you ever stop and think about these devices and how amazing they are? Carl and I will often say, um, we went through the Macca's drive through and he paid for something with his phone. And then he went, 10-year-old me would have thought this was like the like unbelievable, blows my mind. We can do so much with these devices. They are amazing things. So just the device itself without internet or phone capability is amazing. So on here I have photos. It's a camera. I have a torch. I have a tape measure. Did you know you can do that? I didn't until a few days ago, a tape measure. Um, It has um, a clock, an alarm clock, a calculator, the best thing on earth, Um, books at your fingertips. Like all that by itself. Isn't that amazing? But that's in here. No, you don't look as amazed as me. Think about it. It's so amazing that that's in this little thing. Right. But when does it really come into its own? when it reaches full capacity, when it is connected to the internet and when it is connected to a phone network thing. When it is con- I don't know a lot about it, but when it's connected to a network, then it comes into its own. Then we can talk to people and then we can watch movies, really importantly, on my phone, on the plane. That's amazing. Um, it can, um, we can do so much. We can do banking. We can pay for things. We can look at people's lives on social media and and go, wow, that's their real life. That's amazing. Um, It's just, (laughs) it's an amazing device. Without a network, it can do so much. It's good. It can do so much. But with a network connected in, it's powerful. So today, we're going to talk today about being connected and which network is the best one for you. So We're going to kick it off today with an experiment, but normally I would get you to do something. I'm not. Today you just get to watch an experiment on the screens. This is um, set up with a room full of actors and one unsuspecting subject. She's the girl in the purple jacket, and she's there for a free eye appointment, but but it's an experiment with this room of actors. So take a look, and we'll see what happens. We set up a hidden camera experiment to see if this woman would stand up at the sound of this tone simply because everyone else is. You might be thinking you'd never go along with this. Or would you? After just three beeps and without knowing why she's doing it, this woman is now conforming perfectly to the group. But what happens if we take the group away? Elaine, please. Okay, now she's alone, the crowd is gone, and nobody is watching her, except our hidden cameras. What do you think she'll do? She's now conforming to the rules of the group without them even being there. Now, watch what It's pretty powerful, right? 
numbers. All right, come on. Who would have stood? Who would have stood with the buzzer? Oh, so many of you would have. We're real followers. You, what is surprising, what is powerful about that video is that um, patients come in, not actors, actual patients come into the room. She keeps standing and all the patients stand with her. The whole room of non-actors stand with her. Powerful. I totally would have stood. Totally, because I'm a rule follower. Obviously, even when that's not really a rule. So um, I think it's so powerful. But powerfully bad if and when the majority of people behave badly or get it wrong, right? And I think as followers of Jesus, it's easy to enter into this group think, to take our eyes off Jesus and his words and his ways and his works and to be conformed by the people around us. And I think this experiment shows us that most days, most people would rather be wrong with the crowd than be right by ourselves, right? So we'd, most of us would be wrong with the crowd than right by ourselves. It's an interesting statement. So this being challenge, the 40-day adventure that we've just begun is going to help us recenter our lives, refocus right at Jesus. It's going to challenge us to say, I don't want to go with the crowd. I don't want to do what everyone else is doing and just ex- accept culture, accept status quo. After how good my God is to me, how much blessing is put into my life and the future that he promises me, I want to be the greatest follower. He is worthy of my best. And being a great follower of Jesus all starts with being, being in a relationship with him. So this series is going back to the basics to challenge you to grow in your relationship with God by being like Jesus and practicing the keystone habits that Jesus practiced in his life. Last week, Darren talked about the importance of aiming at Jesus and the power that habits can play in our lives. Carl started flossing, which is awesome. I'm going to start overnight oats. That's my thing. I'm just going to start having sorting breakfast at night so in the morning my morning routine is a little bit more streamlined. And hopefully you've been following along with the book or in a small group, but even if you haven't, these messages are still relevant on their own. They're, they're powerful. You can take stuff from them and put it into practice during your week. So each of the habits on their own may mean very little, but as Craig Rochelle says, small habits done consistently over time can produce major results. It's that 1% thing. If we just change things a little bit, but we do it for a long time, amazing results. And I I really feel that God's been speaking to me a lot about this, um, just at the start of this year, really, that perseverance and the discipline of small habits. And, you know, our habits and our disciplines have ups and downs. As I look back over my life, there's ups and downs. There's times when I do things really well or commit to something really well, and then I fall away and I have to recenter and get back onto it. But I don't think that matters. I think if over time we are just trying to get ahead with our habits, trying to put the good things in place, we will see amazing change and incredible fruit and incredible growth, often without you knowing it's even happening. So what we want to do in these Sunday messages is to show you from the Bible and from Jesus' life where we see these habits being practiced and to talk about the benefits of each of these habits. So the theme verse for the series is this, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Walk with me. And work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And Rick Warren, who a lot of you would know, is a very influential church leader. Uh, He said it like this. If you want to have Christ-like character, then you develop the habits that Christ had. All of us are simply a bundle of habits. Our goal is to help you replace some bad habits with good habits that will help you grow in Christ's likeness. So he summarizes and says, our character is the sum of our habits. And if you think about that for a while, I don't know about you, but I pause at that and go, hmm, I don't know that I'm, I'm really like that. I'm a bit scared by that. It's kind of worth considering because I don't have all good habits. But can I replace some of my bad habits with more Christ-like ones and be a bundle of Christ-like habits? I would like that. So today I want to talk to you about the first keystone habit that we're in, invited into. So Jesus committed to community. And the experiment I played shows you the power and the influence that our community around us can have on our lives. We're going to look further at that today. 
So as Jesus started his ministry all those years ago, he sought to go, he was on earth, he sought to go about the thing that God had created him for, that his purpose in this world, that he'd sent him down to this world to do, to rescue all of us and make us righteous before God. That was his purpose. But one of the very first things he does right at the beginning of his ministry is choose a group of people to walk with. And I think if anyone could have gone alone in this world and had a really good outcome, it would have been Jesus, right? He probably didn't need people at all. And in fact, the more we know about the disciples, they probably held him back a little bit. But he committed to community. And why did he do this? Because of this truth, you are not meant to be alone. And I think through this pandemic, we've seen that more than ever, right? We are not meant to be alone. It doesn't do us any good. Right at the beginning in the Bible, God makes this clear. In Genesis 2 verse 18, God says, it's not good for the man to be alone. So he made Eve for Adam. So they had company for each other. You are made to be in community. Jesus, the only one who could have gone about his ministry, could have gone alone and had absolute success, decided to commit to a community of people. But before you go out there and start making any kind of relationship, any kind of community, any kind of network around yourself, let's also realize that the type of community and relationships that we get into are really important. I don't want you just to commit to any kind of community. I want you to commit to a certain type of community because your community influences you, as we saw on the screens a little while ago. So King Solomon in Proverbs um, says this. Proverbs 13.20 says this. If you walk with the wise, you become wise. I think that's a great thing to be. But a companion of fools suffers harm. So habits start with triggers or cues. And I want through this message for you to see that people you associate with can be some of the most powerful triggers that will lead you in the right direction or in the wrong direction. And I've got a couple of examples. So our friends can affect our career, our finances, our investments, and our savings. So if we think about it, who we associate with really affects how we spend money. If we're associating with people who love to acquire material things and go on flashy holidays and eat out at expensive restaurants and they're, they're our close network, they're our friends, then of course we're going to kind of drift into that and go, yep, yep, that's great, I want that too. I want to be able to spend time with you in those environments. So we spend more money in that direction. Or if we see on social media all the flashy things that people have, the purchases, and again, this is real life. This is what people do. This is their best life. Um, we see their new purchases. We see their fabulous holidays. And we're like, I want that too. If they've got that, I want that. And it can affect how we structure our finances and our spending. And I put my hand up for that, holidays. Holidays on social media are my thing. Like if I see someone else on a great holiday... I'll be on to Carl. Carl, I think, I think New Zealand is a great place to go and we should go there for four weeks and we should rent a motorhome and we should see all the amazing things over there. Honestly, it's constant, isn't it, Carl? <laughs> Tasmania is the one that we're looking at now to take our family down. Greek, when we can travel again, I'm going to go nuts. Like holidays, are where I covet is holidays. Um, and, and that's the thing. And, and a portion of our spending has certainly gone towards holidays. And social media has a bit to do with that. But your extended community, your friends, your family, your social media has an impact on where we spend our money and whether we invest and spend wisely or whether we just flash it around and spend. Another interesting point is the closer you are to someone, the more likely you're going to have the same habits as those people. So a little bit like what I just spoke about. But um, an example, Carl and I have these Apple watches. And I'm sure you don't think this at all, but some people might think, well, oh, they've got Apple watches. They're so expensive. And they've got like the best phones and um, they've got his preachers from a tablet and they've got Apple watches now. Um, I need to tell you something. These were actually free. And I have to put that in inverted commas. They were free. So our insurance company, our life insurance company, had this program where um, they gave you an Apple Watch for free if you committed to um, enough exercise every week. You get points every week if you do enough exercise, and that kind of pays off your Apple Watch. But you have to do it for two years two years of working out five to six times a week. That's what we're doing. And 
we have had it for six months and haven't paid a thing. Yes, Carl and Jess. But I tell you, um, it, we would have paid money if I'd been doing it on, this, on my own. Actually, I probably wouldn't. But Carl would have paid money <laughs> if he was doing it without me. We cheer each other on early in the morning on that Saturday when the weekends and or late at night, we're like, come on, we've got to go for a run so we can get our points so we don't have to pay for that stupid watch. So we, ch- <laughs> so we are the fittest we've been and we will be for the next 18 months. Don't know about after that, but... <laughs> uh, and interestingly, I had a conversation with um, Richo, Richard Latham, on Friday night. He and a group of mates from this church have decided that they're going to run and they run together a few times a week and they're getting fitter and they've got aspirations and goals, but it's because they're doing it together. So studies have shown that 95% of our success or failure in life is determined by the people we habitually associate with. And that's quite important because then that means that there may be no more important predictor of future you than the community of current you. I'm going to say that again because that's what all the preachers do. Yep. So there may be no more important predictor of future you than your community now, than the community of current you. So, you know, if you're trying to work on any of the four other habits that we're about to talk about, we're going into scripture, prayer, solitude, and choosing church. They're the four next habits. If you're trying to work on any of those other habits by yourself, it's a little bit like moving, walking up a downward escalator. An escalator's coming down, you're moving up. You'll get there, but it'll be harder than if you're supported by a group of people who are cheering you on. What if your community could point you to Jesus and propel you towards him? So we need to identify who are the people that we're allowing into our lives to influence us and who better to learn from than Jesus and his community. So when we look at the life of Jesus, what we find is that he actually committed to several groups of people. We regularly will think of the 12 disciples, right? But he had other groups as well. And a lot of you would have read this in the in the book of the last couple of days. But in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is recounting the resurrection story of Jesus. And in verse 6, he says this, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. So he had large groups of ta- at times. Um, 500 is a big group. It's like a, it's like a big church. He was in that community. They were brothers and sisters. They were believers. In Luke 10, 1, it says this, the Lord appointed 72 others. And sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. So this is still a large group, but a group of people, 72 strong, that got more intentional time with Jesus than did the 500. He sent them out. Then, of course, there are the 12 that we know and we think about the most. Uh, And there's at least a couple of dozen times in the Gospels that he takes these 12 to the side, spends lots of time with them, explains stuff to them, does life with them. But it goes even deeper than that. There were also an inner three that Jesus had relationship with, even more access to Jesus. They were Peter, James, and John. And in Matthew's gospel alone, just the gospel of Matthew, we see Jesus take these three disciples with him three separate times. He invited them into the room where he raised Jairus' daughter from from the dead in Matthew 5. They got to experience um, on the mountaintop and see Jesus transfigured before God in Matthew 17. And they were also asked to accompany Jesus to pray for strength shortly before his death in Matthew 26. And so you might think, these three guys, they must have been perfection, intellectual, spiritual saints. But they were far from that, as a lot of you know. In Acts 4, Peter and John, the two of the three, are described as unschooled, ordinary men, And all three of them had pretty hot tempers at times. Peter, you'll know, Peter cut the ear off the guard um, in in the um, garden. And poor old Jesus had to whack that thing back on, grow an ear right before his death. I want to fix this mistake that Peter made. He also, Peter also denied Jesus, that he knew Jesus at a really important time, critical point in time. Don't know that man. I don't know who he is. James and John were known as the sons of thunder. I think that's an interesting nickname, Sons of Thunder. They wanted to call down fire on a village that didn't welcome Jesus. Burn them up, Jesus. Call down fire. They're no good. And they all fell asleep while they were supposed to be praying for Jesus just before his crucifixion. 
So here's what it shows me. This is Jesus' community. This is his inner three. And you'd think he'd have the greatest group of friends, group of people around him. But it shows me that community is not always neat and tidy. Uh, it's imperfect. At times it's really tough and awkward. I think Carl's message um, a couple of weeks ago on this was so brilliant in visually illustrating this. We had love and encouragement. We had truth. We had healing. All lovely things. But we also had mess. And the community that we surround ourselves with won't always get it right. But these three in a circle, and you could then argue the 12, the 72, and the 500, they all had something in common despite the mess. They were on the same mission. They followed Jesus. That knit them together, that common cause. So your community will not always, I can prophesy, it will not be easy. You will have conflict. You will get offended and then have to choose what to do with that offense. You will have to go through tough times with people. Those closest to you, uh, you might have conflict with over big things or menial things. But the question I have for you, quite simply, is this. Is your community, the people that you are allowing in your life, are they following Jesus? Are they pursuing him? Because likely if your community is, then you will be too. And if your community isn't, then you may not be either, or you might be drifting. Because your community matters, and whether you know it or not, you are influenced by them. So the challenge for you this week from today's message, but also through the workbooks, um, is really boiling down to intentionally looking at the community around you and asking this simple question, is my community pointing me closer to Jesus? Who do you spend your time with? Who is influencing you? Is your community bringing you closer to Jesus or moving you further away from him? And if this is a hard question, if you struggle to answer that, if you're struggling with loneliness or if you're uncertain of some of the major influences in your life and, but you just know something has to change, then maybe your question is, where do I start? Where do I start? I am being drawn away from Jesus or I don't have any friends. I'm really lonely. Where do I start? Well, I'd suggest you find a, find a group of people that you feel like is living for a noble cause and join them. And for me, there is no more noble cause than the cause of Jesus Christ. So if you're looking for a group of people to join that has big aspirations because of the greatness of God, then consider joining us here at Catalyst. You might be visiting today or you're sitting at home. Consider joining us in person here or commit to online. This is a church family that is not perfect and certainly won't always get it right. May even have some, it absolutely has some conflict amongst us from time to time. But we're coming together with the common goal of transforming lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. And this is a great church with all of my favorite imperfect people in it. That's who you are. You're my favorite not perfect people. Um, but it's also a big group. So just like Jesus, if you're a part of Catalyst already, maybe your next step is to join a smaller group, like a lot of you have for this challenge. But if you haven't, maybe that's your next step. And you can do that. We say this regularly. You can do that by popping your name down in the foyer at the Next Steps desk or uh, um, on the app or the website, there's a button that says Next Steps and you can click on that button and um, put your name down there and say, I'm interested. Or you can talk to Darren or Larry. So many people. Take a step. Find a group of people that can cheer you on, shoulder the load, encourage you, and that can do the same for you. I have had so many conversations recently at different events, and I guess it's people coming back from COVID, but also people coming back from major issues in their life, illnesses and um, events in their life, and they've come back into community, and they're like, I just, I'm craving this. I just so need to be here. Or uh, they've come back, because that's the right thing to do, but then at the end gone, oh, I didn't realize how much I needed that. I needed people around me just to spur me on. I was even thinking worship this morning. I was in worship going, I know there are people here who are doing it tough, who've got things going on. But when you position yourself in a place where there's people around you who are drawing towards Jesus as we are worshiping and lifting up our hands, you can't help but feel the Spirit of God. Just grow your faith in that moment. That's what a community does. So King Solomon, again, tells us in Ecclesiastes, 
It says this, two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. When we get this right, we help each other be more and more like Jesus and we really can do more together. Now, there's one other thing about Jesus. He had 500, he had 72, he had 12, he had three. But he also had a clear one, and that was God himself. God was at the center always. And when we have God at the center and our communities are pointing us towards that center, that's a beautiful thing. But you need them both. You can't just have one. You can't just have God and no one else. That's not how God has wired you. It's not how he's created you. You will make it into eternity, but God's gospel is also right here, right now, getting to experience his kingdom with the people around you, pushing you, cheering you, um, supporting you, encouraging you. That's what he wants for you. So the amazing part about all this, about abundant life and community with others and the fact that we can have a relationship with God is that Jesus made it all possible for you and for me. Jesus' forgiveness is real. He died on that cross so that we could stand forgiven and washed clean so that we could have a relationship with God, with the one. And that's for all of us, not just the good, got it all together people, because they don't exist. And we see it on display. And I talked about how Jesus in a circle, Peter denied him at a really important time just before his death. And when Peter denied him and betrayed him, Jesus didn't remove him from his inner circle. He didn't get offended and then go, that's it. I've got to cut you out of my life. His words of grace towards Peter not only absolved him, but restored his identity. That's what being with Jesus will do. It will restore and reassure us of who we are, who our identity is, that we are children of the Most High God. That's what the words of Jesus do. They restore. And this is what Jesus has done for every single one of us. And it's what we can do through his spirit for one another. We can draw people closer to him so that that all people can really experience that forgiveness, that mercy, that compassion, that grace that Jesus has for each one of us. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for your example of what community is, your perfect example. I thank you that you don't expect perfection from each of us, but you do want to guide us into obedience and fruitfulness and growth with the love and the support of the people around us. Thank you that you've created a place where that can happen. Thank you for your church. And Lord, we know that we will get tripped up. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to annoy each other at times. But I thank you that we are better together. So Lord, we commit again to one another and we ask for you to guide us, to compel us, to transform us within that community so that we can become more like Jesus. And I also want to pray for those in our suburbs, our town, even in this place right now, who are lonely and feeling isolated. And I just pray that you would reveal people to us that we can love and encourage and bring into a place of community and acceptance. Lord, and even right now, that whether people are at home or in here, Lord God, that your touch would just be upon them, that they would know that they do not have to be in that place of loneliness, that they can reach out, they can have that relationship with the one, and then with more because that is exactly how you've um, created us and that's what your church is all about. So we thank you, Jesus, and we just pray that you'd reveal more and more of yourself to each one of us as we journey together over the next few weeks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so that's community. Now you've got more, you've got days ahead in your workbooks about community and little action steps. But really the whole point of that is thinking about who who is in your circle? I've already been doing some thinking. You know, I've got some, you know, some groups that are stronger than others in my 3, 12, 72. Some groups are strong, some are not. And I've got to work on that this week. Oh, and forever. But we all have to work on these things forever. Just, just mind you, this is not just 40 days. I hope you know that. It was a little trick to get you in. But this is a lifelong <laughs> adventure. So, so glad you could be with us here this morning. Please stick around. There's coffee and um, fun times over in the cafe. And um, if you're at home, we'd love to see you here next week or see you online. Have a great week, everyone. Do life together.